So apologies for the small delay, but uh, I'm very happy to welcome you nevertheless to the 17th seminar in, uh, in this series and one of the last before the end of uh, this year. Um, I'm very excited. It, it is one of the seminars that builds upon the seminars we've done on, on imagination and the role of imagination and creative practice in uh, kind of achieving, like a fostering and achieving transformative uh, goals. And I'm very happy to have uh, Cassie Robinson with us um, that uh, works as a strategic designer across a variety of positions of uh, like in industry, government, like arts and culture. It was, I was trying to like summarize her CV in some way that I can make a proper introduction, but it really seems impossible. Um, and Cassie will talk about a project that she has been working on in, uh, in the UK um, and how that project functions as an imagination infrastructure, how it is situated and how things work in practice. So I really hope that um, the more she goes in detail, the more we can learn about her approach and her work. So um, without saying much more like Cassie, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for coming. Oh, thank you for having me. And uh, don't worry about being late. It means that I can talk for a bit less <laughs> or something. Um, yeah, so I have got some slides which I'll um, which I will share. Um, let me just get those up. And hopefully, everyone can see that. Um, I, I was going to do a bit of an intro, um, but I don't think I'm going to bother. It's not very, it's not that interesting. And you can um, read my CV. Um, I'm going to put my video off whilst I do this as well. Um, so, yeah, I guess first I thought I'd sort of start by a bit of a journey to here um, because I'm, yeah, I'm one of like, there's a whole kind of community really growing in the UK around this work. Um, and it kind of started for me, um, the kind of importance of imagination and hope. Um, I guess for many of us, it, it you know, the, the times over many years now have, have felt like they've required um, some, some more hopefulness. Um, there's quite a lot of fatalism in the UK and you know, lots of people in overwhelm um, with austerity has been there for a long time. Um, you know, and I, I probably don't need to go into a lot of detail about why, you know, like just the wider context, uh, you know, but it, but it is, it, it is hard for people to imagine um, in the sort of face of everything that's going on. Um, and I guess that sort of, you know, that also includes the sort of big like the poly crisis, really, all, all of the big kind of macro crises that are going on. Um, and yeah, that it's quite unending and, and unrelenting. And I guess specifically in the work I've been doing, um, maybe before some of the kind of collective imagine, imagination work was coming to bear, is I was, you know, I've worked for a long time in civil society and it felt like civil society, um, you know, it's always getting, it's always there to almost like pick up the mess. Um, it's often there to respond, to be very responsive to like the immediate need and the immediate issues that, that people face. Um, and in some kind of round tables and things I'd been doing uh, like a good few years ago now, I just was really struck by people not being able to think of civil society and, and communities as kind of anything beyond like delivering services and that idea of like what's our role who can we be together um that that like you know and how do our lives exist outside of service delivery so that was some of the kind of like work that led to this for me um and i just really love this quote from Don Donella Meadows, if we haven't specified where we want to go, it's hard to set our compass to muster enthusiasm or to measure progress. But vision is not only missing almost entirely from policy discussions, it's missing from our culture. We talk easily and endlessly about our frustrations, doubts and complaints, but we speak only rarely and sometimes with embarrassment about our dreams and values. And I love that too, because it, 
it kind of speaks to this idea of like what's in our culture around this and I think that's particularly important I'm not going to read out another quote and I guess because I know you're looking at kind of transitions and trans like you know social environmental cultural transitions um, and you're probably familiar with this two loop model from the Bacana Institute, but I guess in this kind of dying system and this emergent system, and particularly in the area around the, on the left hand side around the pioneers, I, I guess that's where some of this work is happening, like how do we support people to have new and different ideas. But I think that we need imagination almost across all these different roles. How do we be more imaginative in how we help things to close down? How do we bring our imagination into the transition um, and into the stabilizing? So even though I think we, we can sometimes think of imagination as being about the new, I think it can also just be about a shift in perspective and, or noticing things differently or tending to things differently. Um, and this is another framework um, that was adapted by Tatiana Fraser um, from Giel's socio-technical transitions theory. And again, this is one of the frameworks I was using in my work at the National Lottery Community Fund. And I think, again, helps to situate some of this imagination work in transitions. And you could say, again, that it's, it's vital in all of these layers, but I think particularly in, in the soil, the roots and the compost, this idea of, you know, where, where healing and myth making and storytelling and culture and narrative and, you know, we need a different soil and I'll talk about that a bit more, but I just wanted to kind of link it to some of the transition frameworks that um, have influenced my work. Another one is this, this systems innovation one. Um, I guess I was feeling like there was not a lot of imaginative work going on in some of the institutions I'd been working in where they would talk about systems change, but I felt like a lot of the work they were doing was actually just making the existing system better rather than kind of these imaginative leaps or like these new logic models that are needed to kind of create an alternative or new system. <clears throat> and also, you know, I often use this as an example of where a kind of citizen assembly or a deliberative democracy process had been used to kind of recognise how people were using things like the bus stops in their city and where they thought bus stops would be useful. But I guess while some of those processes can be helpful, they rarely ask, like, do we need a bus at all? Um, you know, is, is it even about a bus and a bus stop? And so some of this work for me has also come out of that recognition that some of the deliberative democracy approaches, they don't start far upstream enough. Um, and also so much of design work um, happens based on existing data. Um, and I love this quote from Genevieve Bell, that a data is what has been and what not what could be. And therefore it's always conservative and constrained and that again it doesn't make there's not a lot of space for our imaginations in the kind of evidence-based policy making that's so dominant in in certainly in the UK um and, and so that that's some sort of the background to sort of my journey but also recognizing that there there's also lots of other initiatives and people doing work in this space and so yeah like We've got Penny here, um, you know, who's been doing House of Imagination for some time, Rob Hopkins and his book From What Is to What If, Jeff Mulgan's kind of paper on the imaginary crisis, um, and Rob Shorter and his imagination wheel. So these things were all like growing as practices and ideas, um, alongside some of the things I, I just sort of originally mentioned. And so when I was at the lottery, I created this new funding program called the Emerging Futures Fund. This was in the first year of the pandemic, so in 2020. And I guess that was because it felt like a time to not only invest in the immediate need, which was what a lot of our funding was going towards, but actually how can we 
provide communities with funding to think differently to to have that time and space to imagine together what else might be possible um and we had 52 grants across the uk and yeah some of it was about resourcing communities to process the impacts of the pandemic and to find their voices um to shape their preferred futures some of it was about can you know can we equip communities with the skills resource and capability to anticipate imagine and shape their futures and i guess in doing so because there were so many grants across the uk i think that's when we started to think about it as an infrastructure so how do we also support that whole network of 52 grants to kind of become something together and a kind of ongoing infrastructure for community listening, sensing and imagining. And sort of one of the initiatives that I'll just touch on um, as an example was something called New Constellations, who worked with Barrow, um, a, a town up in the north west of England on the coast and New Constellations partnered with the local council and the community to go on a voyage together and it was beautifully designed it was not just asking their opinion on where a bus stop might go or not even saying to them what do you want it was it was designed as a process to really connect people to a sense of place to a sense of history to a sense of future generations to a sense of their pride and belonging in barrow and their relationships together in shaping what Barrow could become. Um, and they just did an amazing set of different activities from kind of these big ball, uh, billboards around the town. They set up a phone line asking people to share their boldest dreams. Um, and they took people through like an embodied and immersive journey, a, a group from the community. And this is just some of the things that came from that. Um, and I think what was so powerful about that work is because it was in partnership with the council, the council um, then adopted kind of what the community came up with as a set of guiding principles for how some of their funding would be spent going forward. Um, and they're still sort of, that's a very active kind of group and initiative that's still happening 18 months on. And from, from that, we... I guess, yeah, started to try and build this more as a field, more as an as an infrastructure. So we hosted an event later that year called Imagination Infrastructuring, and we had 900 people come from all over the world. Um, and, and, and sort of recognizing that, you know, as a funder at that time, hoping to get other funders on board too, with this idea that this is really important work and like nobody seemed to really be resourcing it um so a bit more about where we are now um so i've i've sort of now left the national lottery community fund um and i'm working across a bunch of different funders um but luckily one of them joseph roundtree foundation and hopefully some more of them do want to continue to invest in this as a growing field so these are just some of the new things that are happening like obviously the the existing practitioners like Penny who's here are, are sort of continuing with their work um, and hopefully we can play a role in helping to grow and strengthen that um, but you know the RSA have now launched a collective imagination design brief for their student design awards unearthed which was something I seed funded at the lottery and now doing a UK tour going through around lots of different communities and doing practices around collective imagination um, new constellations who did the work in Barrow are now doing a whole range of different um, versions of that in other places in the UK and Maya group are hosting a kind of community of practice. So those are just some of the, the sort of things that have happened over the last sort of 12 months. And it's been really lovely to see how organisations like Canopy, who'd already been doing work around social imagination, have developed, like deepen and develop their practice because we're hopefully bringing more legitimacy to some of this work and more visibility. Um, so they've developed this kind of compass around social imagination. 
um, and have really done an amazing job at, at, at trying to kind of uh, like look more deeply at what is it as a practice, um, what does it mean, what does it involve, um, and kind of what are the conditions that enable social imagination to happen. And obviously I'll share these slides that have got all the links into all these people's work. Um, so that I think that's been really lovely to see this this growing group of people who were already doing some of this work or maybe calling it different things like coming together and feeling like there is a growing appetite and recognition for, for, for why this is important. Um, and I guess, you know, I've touched on some of these already, but these are now kind of some of the things that are underpinning the work that we're doing with Joseph Roundtree Foundation. Um, you know, this idea of if our, is our imaginative capacity at an all time low? Um, and the fact that, you know, this isn't just about coming up with some new ideas, actually, sometimes it's about noticing things differently. And sometimes it's about what intelligence is, what, what are we, what's the material that we're using for our imagining? You know, are we actually thinking from a different soil? So we're not just repatterning things. And obviously a key part of all of this work has been like who gets to imagine. So how are we being mindful and thoughtful about like who's in these spaces, who's being resourced, who was already doing these things for generations um, and, and we can just like try and support and strengthen that. Um, and to move away, you know, to try and keep moving away this idea that from this idea that civil society is just about service delivery and that you know while citizen assemblies are really important they are not enough um or they're different you know that they are not the same as this pra these practices that we're talking about um and that you know we recognize that in some co-design and participatory processes we're never accounting for communities don't know what they don't know and they can't imagine what they can't imagine, you know, so how do we create those conditions? Um, and, you know, it does feel like we do need more than ever something that can pull us, orient us, give us hope. Um, and that this is a practice, it's something, you know, we learned a lot from the Emerging Futures Fund. We could really see a difference in those grants where communities we're just thinking of it as a visioning exercise, like taking some art materials into the local community centre and coming up with an idea together versus actually seeing this as a craft and a practice to develop over time. Um, you know, I think anyone can do it, but I, I do think it is a practice. Um, and, and really important in all of this is, because often when you talk about the imagination, we go straight to thinking about individuals and creativity in schools or, but actually in the work that we're doing, we are particularly interested in starting from almost like the unit of the collective and that idea of what can the collective imagine that an individual never can. Um, and, and some of the questions we're asking, um, which is about what are the most effective conditions for this work to emerge from? What are the kind of containers for this work to be practiced within? Um, you know, can we link this work around collective imagination to communities having a greater sense of agency? What happens over time if imagination is practiced? What are the cumulative effects of a more imaginative society? Um, you know, can we link this work more effectively into decision-making? Um, <clears throat> I'm, I'm going to skip over those. Um, and I guess in we've we've spent the last few months bringing together some of the practitioners, some of the policy people, um, some more funders, and now we're looking at you know where there's breadth of work to do and where there's depth of work to do. So you know, really looking at this idea of like a UK wide trip that kind of a bit like what Unearthed is doing, so maybe like just adding into what they're doing, but trying to encourage more communities across the UK and, and resource them to, to have that space and time to imagine, but also to try and 
spotlight and highlight where amazing work is already happening so where where are those seeds of the future already in existence and can we do kind of uk wide narrative and storytelling around that and also experiment with more mass public imagination like imaginings but then also looking at depth so we have got this growing group i would say there's probably like 12 to 15 small organizations that are doing what they call collective imagination practice and there'll be lots more that are just not calling themselves that that we want to kind of connect in with and, and find but can we what can we learn from those how can we support them and how can we grow who's doing this work so those are sort of two of the areas that we're now looking at um, and joseph roundtree foundation have committed some funding um, to this and um, we're hoping to bring in other funders too and then I thought I'd just leave the, these are the questions that a couple of weeks ago, I gave a talk in Australia to a group of um, sort of transition design um, students. And I just thought I would share these questions because they might also be, be relevant for some of your work. Um, so, so some of the things I was sort of asking them to think about, are like what are the sites you can use for this work? Like I love the idea that this grows as a practice in the sites, you know, the local parks, the town halls, the community centres, like what are the, what's the physical infrastructure and the social infrastructure that, that can support this work? And, you know, what does the right container for the work look and feel like? Um, what are the conditions that you need to cultivate? So what happens before and after and in an ongoing way? around this work, who needs to be there, who are the decision makers, what's going to happen um, from what comes out of this work, whose imagination, who's taking part, and what about the more than human world too, which is very relevant to sort of your, your work here in this community. Um, what ingredients are you bringing in to go deep, to go weird? You know, that I, I really think that idea of like messing, like messing up the the, the the sort of known and the expected and how can you lay the ground for ongoing practice and then kind of what's the narrative you're going to use for engagement and this was partly because some of the people I mean some of the people that we're connected into are trying to do this work in places where you talk about a collective imagination and they're like what does that even mean or you know this that's very like um woolly or not rigorous or um so some of the narratives we've been playing around with is that idea of like you know is how much of this is like a public good superflux who i know are part of this group um who do amazing work and are always an inspiration they talked once about public imagination as a public service um, and I love this idea of we dream not just for ourselves, but as a part of a wider community in which we live. Um, and another way we've been sort of framing it is its purpose is to unsettle the present rather than just predict the future. And sort of widening the aperture of what one imagines to be possible. So that kind of starting from a different soil, again, I think of as like stretching or opening up to something very different um, and of course there's never one future one imagining so how do you hold space for it to feel plural um, yeah to kind of contain multitudes um, and then lastly but I think for me it's one of the most important is how are you ensuring that the practice centers the collective um, so I, I don't know if that's given you lots more detail because I suppose in a way um, I'm not the practitioner. Um, I'm trying to, I guess, with others create the space and bring in more funding and resource and you know try and I'm trying to build the field. So in a way, my practice is more the field building, but I'm lucky to be connected into lots of other people that are. You know doing the practice um yeah and that that's my presentation um sorry it's quite a lot of words <laughs> um but we'd love to hear questions thoughts what did didn't make sense 
um, you know, and you've got, like I say, you've got Penny here, um, and there's there's others that are probably here in this group that that are doing the practice and. And, you know, we've been so lucky in some of the convening we've done also to link in with some of the more academic people, like Penny's obviously situated within Bath Spa. There's an amazing woman called Kerry Facer who's at Bristol University and like, so like deep academic thinking and, and knowledge and research around this too, which again, I'm, I'm hoping we can keep connecting up and growing into, in this field. Hey, thank just, you so much. Let's see. Oh, sorry. You go. Go ahead, Penny. I was just going to thank Cassie and open the floor to, to the conversation. So please go ahead. You know, I was just going to thank Cassie for the shout out, but I think also I think it's really important what you say that it is also held in an academic space as well as you know the practice on the ground. And I think both are really relevant. And you're right to give Kerry a shout out. As you know, we're doing a project on temporal imagination together um so yeah it's really vital and i think you know with your work and colleagues in the room it is creating that sense of a movement which is fabulous and one other thing i'll just say because <clears throat> this is maybe something that some people here might have some thoughts on one of the questions we did have before we did these work more recent workshops so we, we, we did some workshops because we were, I guess, trying to make the case of it to the JRF board for a start. Um, but one of the questions I had put on a slide back then was, you know, can we evidence, like knowing that we, we, we were always going to need to tick some boxes to get funding or to land this into some of the policy agenda. Um, so a question was, can we evidence how doing this kind of imag collective imagination work further upstream actually um, does bring new, different, more courageous, more long lasting, more sticky ideas over time, um, rather than just doing the kind of more deliberative democracy or the ideation stuff or the co-design things that you might, have, might do more as a designer, which is my background. Um, so is there something about that this, this goes deeper um, and into more unfamiliar territory and, and what what's the different outcomes from that. But I we took that out because when we did the evaluation and learning workshop around this, someone said, um, you know, don't, that you almost like don't need to try and evidence that. It's more about what, what change it, like don't put it in comparison to, is like let's just go with the fact that doing work around like, like our collective imaginations are, are going to have things that are really important and vital so more to evidence what changes because of this work rather than is is collective imagination um more important than deliberative democracy or that kind of thing anyway i just thought i'd share that's one of the things that's shifted for me in this work Would anyone else like to say something? I have a lot of questions. Well, Anne. I, I could come in. I mean, I when I hear things like this, I get a bit tongue tied by excitement. So I'll just apologize for being um, perhaps um, just, just kind of super excited in a good way. But also it really strikes me listening to Cassie and kind of be interesting to see what, what Cassie thinks about this is, is one of the things that we've been trying to work through in Creatures is how we orientate to the research and to the policy elements and to the creative practice in a way that is respectful of all of them, but sees perhaps how um, creative practices can be part of governance and how being creative is part of being a policymaker and how the research is something that, that perhaps mediates between them as a form of understanding what we're trying to do and trying to bring in Perhaps these different kinds of methods from from traditions. I mean, my own background is as a drama teacher, so when I hear people talking about collective imagination, I think that's probably why I'm going like this, because it's always about the group and it's always about how things could be, and then it's always about kind of bringing that back to what we can reflect on as ourselves and what we can learn from it. So it really feels like that has been doing that for um, in a very very localized way. And one of my great sadnesses back already in the 80s and 90s in Britain was how that got. 
kind of squeezed out of a curriculum where it was actually welcomed and met and made part of how education worked. But um, that's sorry, that's just me um, going off onto a tangent. But I think there's something about the way that listening to Cassie, it seems really apparent is how much creative work you're doing to reshape the narratives of what it means to to have influence. And even your last comments about whether it needs to be done in a kind of we're comparing all these different methods in an evidence based way or whether we're trusting that there's something important here and then being able to show what is important. And then I suppose a supplementary question continues to be and it's one we're really struggling with as we look at how creative practice makes change and whether it's making it in the usual paradigms or actually reinventing the paradigms is how do you then convince people who are perhaps not interested in this way of thinking about things. So can I just garble a bit and sorry Cassie but there's just so much there to respond to. No, I'm happy to try I mean yeah and I, I feel do feel with a lot of this I don't have the answers either and I go through weeks of like is this really the thing to be putting everything behind or is, you know but so a few things in what you said I mean firstly when we did these workshops recently the policy one was like an absolute flop it was the one that really went badly um and that was partly I don't think I don't think we had the right policy people in the room but also because I don't think I'd framed it you know it just it just didn't go very well um luckily it was sort of saved by um, I suppose what's really great about doing this work at the moment with Joseph Browntree Foundation as one of the kind of partners and funders is they're so known for their policy and research work and actually you know Paul um, Kissick who uh, runs this and I know this has been recorded but I really like Paul's great so I'm not going to say anything that I wouldn't want him to hear like Paul you know Paul worked for years in the civil service um, and I think he you know he was one of the people in that policy workshop that just sort of said there's so much in policy making that is very unimaginative and it, it, it is very like it, it's so driven by the opposite kind of material for decision making um and and, and I, it's not only that it's like sort of relies more on like quant and linear um kind of pretending that we know we, we you know that you can model things and it, things are certain I actually think a lot of policy making is is not even done with very much thought at all. You know, it's, it's, it's done with in a really hurried way. Um, so I think that's another thing that shifted. I think originally, so the whole frame of that policy workshop, we, we have been looking, and I think we will continue to look at how it can link to policy work that's going on around leveling up, because that does feel in the UK like that's a big policy agenda. Um, but actually, and I think we're really lucky with Andy Haldane now heading up the RSA and also sort of being the chair of the government's levelling up unit. And Andy is a big fan of imagination. Like, so that that's all very helpful. Um, but I think actually it, it's made us think we should probably do some work specifically with policymakers around imagination. And I think like that, and I loved it this week, Paul Kissick tweeted for the first time something something and then he used the words imagination and I was like yeah <laughs> um you know so so I think there is something about that the other thing that I found quite challenging and maybe this is where you'll all have some um thoughts but it links to that thing around creative practice is for two years in a row now I've done a I've done a session at the new local stronger communities event which is very much based it's all local government really and I was really lucky to have Sam Sam Plum there who who's the chief exec of Barrow Council and she's amazing and obviously she could really talk to how the approaches around this have really worked there and and been very different to things they've done before so that's great um but it's really hard in some of those contexts where lots of people there might work in local government as kind of participation officers or arts and culture. They've got slightly different names, but they, they, their, their role is all about engaging the community, doing kind of, you know, participatory or even creative activity with them. So they would, when I talk, sometimes they their kind of comments are like, but this is what we already do. And it's quite hard because 
I don't think it is a lot of the time what they're doing. And I, I don't want that to sound mean, but it kind of isn't the same, but it's quite hard then to know what to do with that. If people think it's what they're already doing, but you feel like this is actually really quite different. You don't want to be, you know, like, I, I, yeah, that's one of my biggest things is how to, how to keep trying to grow this, this understanding that this is distinct from some of those other things without um, diminishing what others are doing. If, if I can just come back quickly and say that, I, again, we completely recognize that. And then one of the reasons that we um, kind of went into business, so to speak, as, as creatures was to try and work out what aspects of engaging with others and working together to imagine difference could be most effective. And that's in a sense our research question. And then of course, effectiveness is really problematic because if you look at things from different perspectives, then even the notion of effectiveness becomes almost meaningless. If you're really making something that can be transformative of, of whole cultures and areas. But this sort of, we recognize that because one of our problems in, in talking is exactly, you know, if people think that that creative just means that they're going to go and 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 kind of do a mural, but there's no actual engagement with thinking about what that represents or why that's transforming their area. And yet, and to give a, a shout to another group which you may be um, um, working with, with the Creative Carbon Scotland, talking about um, embedded artist scheme, where we were actually looking at what it took to make that into something that was more than just the normal sort of practice of whatever was going in. So they went into a, a, a bicycle charity to, to see what happened if they put an artist in. And as it happened, that was one where the outcome was that everybody started to think about how their city might be different, but it could have been an entirely different outcome if it had been somebody else and they had been really just looking at kind of like how to put a bicycle mural up or something like that so it's sort of I completely understand that and just yes and I think we're in the same 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 challenges in that sense and thank you I think I better shut up because a lot of other people here thanks a lot Johannes you want to go next Oh, thanks a lot. This was really inspiring. Uh, just two quick questions. So you talk about like, the communities that you engage with. Are they always communities of, of place so that they, I mean, you, is this the, like on the neighborhood scale or maybe city scale or living in place? Or have you also worked with like dispersed communities of some sort of communities of interest or something? Mean, you alluded a little bit to that when you talked about policymakers and would be a, more like a community of interest perhaps. Um, and secondly, the, the kinds of infrastructures that you talk about, what are, what are they? What are they? Um, could you be more specific about that? What the, the resources that you that you provide uh, provide? Um, I mean, like the the wires and the pipes and the relays and all, all those. The, the hidden normally we use infrastructure concept to to speak about that, which allows the rest of the life to happen and go on. So it's, it's often the unseen and below ground. So, but what are your below ground resources that you provide the communities with? Good question. So the, for the first question, um, with the fund that we are hopefully launching with JRF and others, I mean, there, there is definitely gonna be a small fund, but we're wanting it to be a bigger fund. Um, and the idea there is that we will have two different strands um, for, for these for these kind of experiments, um, and maybe that's not even quite the right word. One will be place based, and it is like neighbourhoods, towns, and one will be thematic. So, you know, we, with Unearthed, who are doing this tour, they they have been doing some things with like farmers, people working around food and farming. Um, we definitely want to do one specifically with young people. Um, so yeah, kind of thematic group, like thematic and then place-based are the two that we're looking at. I think in terms of the infrastructures, I think like that's where I'm still working. Like we, we came up with this term imagination infrastructuring and it's like, do we really know what we mean? So in the lottery context, um, when we set up the Emerging Futures Fund, we did think about all the other things we could do that you might think of that are a bit hidden 
Um, so we we brought in an archivist, someone that had used that had been at Flickr, because a lot of the a lot of the work that was coming out of those grants was content. You know, they weren't. It, it was yeah, it was it was all kinds of different content. So one of the roles was how can we start to build up a kind of archive of all the different stuff that's coming out of that those collective imagination activities. And I guess the ambition at that point was to keep growing that as as a place that was building up, yeah, the material of people's collective imagination. We also, um, you know, did regular convening and created like learning content. So so like the kind of like infrastructures around like learning and sharing work. Um, we also brought in support around like local media. So trying to kind of create a bit of an infrastructure around this sort of storytelling and narrative work. Um, and then I think like we were trying to play a role as a funder that was about that, that trying to grow the field. And that I think of that really as infrastructuring. Um, I don't really know what I think the difference is between field building and infrastructuring. So maybe I need to think about that. Um, Obviously, then I left the lottery, so a lot of the, the potential of some of that infrastructure wasn't realised, like the ambition really of that work wasn't fully realised. Um, but now I think think of that infrastructure, it is, it, it, at the moment we've almost got four different types of activity from funding programmes to trying to do comms and narrative work to trying to like grow the field and bring more people in to deepen the practice and all of those things need infrastructure to kind of keep them going and that's kind of what I'm thinking now as the kind of infrastructuring but I I don't know what I mean the differences between the field bidding and infrastructuring so if you have any ideas please put them in the chat <laughs> I, I suppose one last thing I, I I am really interested though in you know, so I talk about, I think of infrastructuring as that it's the long-term investment in something. It's that resourcing of something over time and the maintaining of it. So, and the care and repair. And, and so that, I think the, the, the ground that we're laying and, you know, that, that kind of idea of archiving does feel important. Like it's not, it, 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 I don't want things to just disappear into thin air. So, so just even the documenting of what we're doing and, and that, that kind of growing feels like another important aspect of the work. And yes, you put a comment on the chat. Would you like to say something or? I was, uh, Cassie would second guess what I'd say, but yes, yeah, so the metaphor of the forest and the field is beautiful because then it's supported by the mycelium network and the roots underneath and the infrastructure then supports the developing field and the developing practice. I love your phrase field guide as well. I think that works really well. I don't like the word toolkit. It's too clunky. Okay, Hilary, you, want, you have a question as well. Yeah, Hilary. I'm, I'm from um, Happy Museum and Transition Network. So as Transition Network, one of the very grateful recipients of the Emerging Futures Fund. And it's really great to hear that this is not disappearing, that it's flowering in many places. Um, I was really liking what you said about the, this idea that this has this work has value in and of itself. And if we that we need to start from that place rather than thinking about um, whether we have to, to kind of uh, because then you allow flowering of different models. And I, I used to struggle with the idea that you couldn't just have one really good model and that actually you need lots and lots of different different versions and that nature tells us that 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 you know the flowering of different types of responses is is as strong as, ha as having um, one really strong model. And I was thinking about two networks that I'm part of, Happy Museum is one and um, the Co-Creating Change Network. And in both of those, rather than trying to create a fixed model, we've looked at what are the conditions. So hearing you talking about the conditions and the infrastructure, what, and your questions were excellent. I kind of wanted to write them all down because it's those questions that, that, that come from what is the, 
what are the conditions that allow this to be its best version? So if we're saying that it's, it has value in, in and of itself, what are the conditions we need to create in order to support it to be the best it can? And that in both the Co-Creating Change Network and Happy Museum have allowed people to kind of step into it at quite a simple level and not be put off by the fact that they're possibly not doing the very best, most you know, expansive version but they can look at the principles or the conditions that they should work on and say, okay, we, we didn't do that well, but maybe if we'd made sure we had the right people in the room, we would have got further, or if we'd done this, we would have got a bit further and they can build their practice um, using those as a kind of, a, a, almost like a scaffolding to help them build, build the best version that works for them in their location. So, um, yeah, I was thinking about that, and it's not really a question, but it's it's that idea of of uh, the conditions that that work as well as the infrastructure, um, or could be another way of looking at the infrastructure. But it's great. I'm so pleased to hear that this is still going going strong. Um, fantastic. Yeah, and and I think um, to like I, I think continuing that metaphor of the roots and the mycelium and I guess there's that's always the tension isn't it in kind of the field building role or the infrastructuring um is like who does that and how does it never feel too centralized like that's why I really don't want JRF to be the only funder like it needs to be multiple funders um and you know i mean i i i don't it there needs to be some people whose focus is always on the the roots and the mycelium and the in-between spaces um but like that doesn't that doesn't have to be me like we need quite a few people doing that i think and it might not be me over time we will probably end up actually recruiting for that person but i think we sometimes you know because there's sometimes tensions around like people yeah like ha who does that paying attention to the to the mycelium who tends to the mycelium and the roots and the in-between spaces i guess is just another aspect of this work when you're trying to grow something as a field um so if anyone has any thoughts about that as well i liked roy's comment as well oh yeah i've not heard of that i'm gonna look that up thank you um yeah there's something really strange about thinking utop about utopia factories like this kind of industrial production of utopias <laughs> bit of a paradox there i've just put my slides in there as well in case they're useful then you've got all the Do i have time for a yeah. quick question maybe yeah um, go ahead okay Th uh, thank you so much for this cassie i think it's fascinating um and I guess my question, uh, maybe maybe it has two, two parts, but they do come together, I, I swear. Um, one is about whether you see some of this work as related to what others call uh, literacies, right? So future literacies as a development of, of a kind of an individual capacity to make sense of the future. And related to that, uh, which I, I find problematic, but I'm, I'm wondering what, what you think. And the second is, um, whether whether you 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 um, have have something to comment about about where the collectivity actually comes in. Um, so what's the difference between putting a bunch of people in a room to imagine versus to actually have a collective imagination? Um, I don't know some stuff I'm wondering about. Um, <clears throat> so I mean this is a bit of a cop out, but I, I'd actually love to have that conversation with you more deeply if you're up for it um, and I can get your email because I, I think firstly with the future literacies I don't think I know enough about that as a kind of school of thought or field of practice to, to say to comment but I feel when we were doing the Emerging Futures Fund some of that was focused more on can you grow the capacity in communities to do kind of strategic foresight or like, yeah, like their, their ability in communities to do kind of foresight. And I think of that as like futures literacy. Um, and that, it kind of felt like the more that we took that trajectory, there was something that started just tonally to feel quite different from the collective imagination stuff. But that, I mean, that's not a very academic or, I mean, it's just like a sense that there, 
I, I don't, I think there's value in both actually. So I, it, I, I don't know enough about it, like I say, to know what your sort of, what, what you don't like about that. But I think there is, there's, there's a, there is a distinction though. Um, and maybe that's where the collective comes in too. Um, and I think that idea of the collective practice, again, I think that's so, that for me is the bit that's so underdeveloped because I, I actually don't, I don't really know hardly anyone that is really doing that as a practice and, or, or they might be, but they're not calling it that, of course. Um, and that is where I think the greatest opportunity is. And I think it's just, you know, I, I've taken that a bit from, um, you know, the Je Jeff Mulgan's work around collective intelligence around that idea that he talks about that what does the individual what does a collective know that an individual never can and I guess in the collective imaginary um whether that's our collective conscious our collective unconscious you, you know what that that just feels like there's there's something in that that I don't think we can access just on our own um and I wonder what it will take for us to be able to access that more together. But the kind of ritual that like someone I know is going to start doing more work around collective ritual. Um, and I think we did actually put in a fund. This was before I worked as a funder when I had no success ever of ever getting any funding for anything. <laughs> but I put in a proposal to Nesta's Collective Intelligence Fund around collective we weren't talking about that was around collective like collective wisdom and collective consciousness and practices around that but they didn't go for it because it wasn't scientific enough um but yeah i would love to talk more about that um if you're up for that roy yes i am cool <laughs> i'll um oh there's lots in the chat oh uh, yeah i'll i'll get your pop your email in the chat or i'll um get it off christina but I feel like those are the sorts of questions that my brain what and, and the one about infrastructure, like what else, what else could we be doing and thinking about in terms of this idea of infrastructuring? Any of any of your brains on that I would really value. So well, it seems that this is the perfect timing to stop <laughs> the seminar. It's exactly one o'clock. Um, so thank you so much, Cassie. Thanks so much, everyone, for the interesting conversation. Um, and I will, I, I will connect you, and then I will, uh, we can follow up with some next um, gatherings as well. Cool. Oh, we've put, we've just put all the emails in the chat anyway. <laughs> um, yeah, but yeah, I'd love. I, I, I just think your, this whole program, the creatures stuff, I love it. So any way to kind of keep connected in and like link up stuff, I'd be so keen to. I think it's amazing. So yeah. It's Thanks wonderful to hear. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone for coming. All right. Thank you. Bye. Bye. <laughs>